To find out how much carbon is in a bag of coffee, offsetters went to Salt Spring Island to investigate. If you're really going to meet and understand Salt Spring Coffee, you have to come to where they live, to where it was founded and to where the coffee is roasted, uh, to really get into the product. Massive big fan down there, just pulling the heat out of the out of the beans. It's very critical. It's between the first and second crack, depending yeah. on where you want it, what your roast or where the development is. Yeah. Mickey has probably reduced the majority of the emissions that are already in his supply chain. He's an environmentalist and has been for a really long time. So they go in here, oh, okay. and then uh, well, they've I already done their carbon footprint. They've reduced those emissions as best they can and for the balance they've purchased carbon offsets. They are technically, their company is carbon neutral. Now what we need to do is make sure that their individual coffees are carbon neutral from a product life cycle perspective. So we're starting with their Nicaraguan coffees. So we're going all the way back to the fields in Nicaragua and measuring all of the various carbon emissions between there and here, roasting, packaging, distribution, and then actually usage of the coffee right down to the coffee cup and eventually will go to the landfill. Today we're calling Nestor and Nicholas in Nicaragua and we're going to find out a little bit more about the agricultural process for coffee and uh, the processing that's done in Nicaragua. Nestor's here sat next to me and I'm trying to get it on speakerphone. Oh, awesome. It's sort of like detective work. You've got to ask the right questions to get the right answers. But in the majority of the places where we're buying with salt spring, the wet mill is on the farm and that's the traditional model. So it's transported by, by person or by mule, but it's still within that farm property or within yes. the farm. If it is a centralized wet mill. We need to have a better understanding of the actual agricultural process, where vehicles are used, where electricity is used, where is the carbon emissions in the process. Um, it's important to have the people there on the ground be able to tell us that. Once, you know, once yeah. it's been bagged yeah. and exported, then it gets loaded into a container yeah. and then it gets shipped to the container port. We're a greenhouse gas specialist, so we love the detail. Uh, we love getting into the nitty gritty. So would it be trucked to the receiving station? Correct. Where is energy expended during the manufacture, the distribution, and the use of coffee? I'm Rich, this is Will, uh, and we're the carbon analysts. So one of the first steps in analyzing the footprint is developing a map. We're going to look at all the machinery, for example, that is, is necessary to take the beans to the drying mills. Um, and what we've learned so far that's interesting is a lot of that work has been done by hand. The devil's in the details. You have to look at all the individual pieces that make up the chain. I mean, coffee, it's grown in the fields of Nicaragua, right? It's processed, it's shipped, and then it's roasted, and then it's delivered, and then it's consumed. So you have to actually take, take apart that chain into that minute detail to understand, well, where are the elements of the supply chain that we can start to reduce these greenhouse gases? <music> So, Mickey, the overall number for a 400-gram bag of, of coffee from Nicaragua was measured at 1,807 grams of carbon dioxide. And that's through all five stages of production from the raw materials and pre-processing, um, which was the emissions from the farms um, and the diesel generated and the transportation to and from the co-ops. Um, that represented only a, about 2% of the final footprint. The next stage was the production which looked at the transport from Nicaragua all the way to uh, BC and the production of the beans, so the roasting of the beans. And that was the second largest uh, stage of the footprint, which was 
th 31%. The next stage was retail and distribution. So uh, getting those bags to the retail stores and then the bags actually sitting on the shelves. Uh, that represented 4% of the total emissions from the process. And then the largest uh, step was in the consumer use. So that's in the brewing of the coffee. So the consumer phase actually uh, amounted to about 39% of the total footprint. And the last stage was end of life. And that's uh, when the consumers get rid of their, their coffee waste um, and often the filter that they use, the paper filter and the bag as well. That was uh, the third biggest step and amounted to about 24% of the total footprint. I was actually quite shocked when the facts came back about uh, the consumer side, you know, that that actually represents the majority of the CO2 in the bag. And I, I must say I was, uh, I was surprised. Well, often people think that the supply chain has the highest amount of carbon. Uh, that would be the transportation and the trucks and the marine shipping. Uh, but what a, a one bag of coffee really represents such a small amount of a truckload or a, a full shipload of, of goods. Uh, the consumer is actually responsible for the highest amount of emissions. That's because when the consumer gets a bag of coffee, their emissions are magnified because you end up brewing a pot 12 times. They use a lot of electricity when they grind their coffee as well as when they brew their coffee. And then they also use their dishwasher uh, to clean the cups. When we were approached by offsetters to uh, get involved in a life cycle analysis, I was, you know, pretty excited. We were one of the first to get involved in organic coffee, you know, fair trade coffee. Now it's carbon neutrality. So I think we're always, you know, being um, a leader and, and, a, and a teacher and uh, it feels good.